You are listening to The Terroir Podcast on Paris Underground Radio. Welcome back to The Terroir Podcast. I am Caroline Connor, otherwise known as Wine Dine Caroline and host of Leon Wine Tastings in the culinary capital of France. And I am here with my friend and co-host, Emily Monaco. That's me. Hello. I am Emily Monaco. I am a food nerd and culinary journalist uh, based in Paris, which is not the food capital of France. Fun fact. <laughs> and this week, we're super excited to be back to chat about a super foodie region, which is, well, Périgord, Dordogne. Are they the same thing? Kind of? Not really? We're going to get into it. We're going to get into it. This is a really special part of the world. It's so beautiful here. It's a part of France that the British, which we'll talk about a lot, have always been very attached to. And so they it does you know, get a lot of tourism and it is all about eating and drinking. So let's get into it. Yeah, totally. So I think first, first we're going to want to kind of break things down geographically and like geopolitically. And there's going to be a lot of geopolitics in this. Your, your people, your British people. Mm-hmm. Are, are are highly present in this area over time. Over the next three episodes, we're going to explore these interrelated regions. There's a lot of overlap here, and so we thought we would keep them together. And as always, this is a podcast about food and wine and place. We're going to talk a lot about history, and we're going to really do a deep dive. Yeah, a deep dive. And to start our deep dive, we're going to start big and kind of zoom in. So without spending too, too much time over, you know, the long history of Aquitaine, we do kind of need to talk about this area just from a historical standpoint. We're going to be talking a lot about the different parts of history over in this area. But but I think one of the first things we need to kind of suss out is that we have these two terms, Dordogne and Périgord. And they're both part of the region that is currently known as Nouvelle Aquitaine, so New Aquitaine. And kind of nearby, we've got Bordeaux. Now, Bordeaux, obviously, I don't think I need to present it, although, Caroline, I am expecting you to present. (laughs) I want to know everything there is to know about Bordeaux by the time we finish episode two of this three-part series. We're going to devote three whole episodes to this area because there's so much to talk about. We could do two seasons on this. Oh, my God. So I'm not going to tell you everything there is to know about Bordeaux because I can't in the (laughs) amount of time that we have. damn it, Caroline. Uh, Yeah, I know. I'm going to do my best. (laughs) (laughs) But Bordeaux isn't technically in either the Dordogne or the Périgord. It's about an hour to the west. And it's both a city and more broadly, I mean, you're going to, it's the word used to refer to the region around this, the actual conglomeration of Bordeaux. So this word, the Bordelais, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, includes a lot of winemaking towns and villages and areas kind of outside of the city of Bordeaux. Because in the city of Bordeaux, we're not actually growing grapevines. So No, but there is wine, wine very close by. There is wine very close by. And then, so also in addition to Dordogne, Périgord, and Bordeaux, we're going to talk a little bit about this sort of historical area known as Quercy, which is Q-U-E-R-C-Y, which is no longer known as Quercy. And it's instead sort of the departments of Lou and Tarn et Garonne. So it kind of links up the Périgord to the west, Gascony to the south, which is a whole other thing, Mm -hmm. Auvergne to the east, which is another whole other thing. But we're going to include this little area in this episode as it shares a lot of culinary history and culture with the area. I think one thing that's really important to understand is that Aquitaine in the past, and we're talking like Middle Ages, was kind of its own thing. And if you've heard of Aquitaine, it's probably because you've heard of Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was let's be quite honest here, a total badass. Yeah, she was a bad bitch. She really was one of the only women who had a lot of power. Yeah, ton of power. Part of the reason she had a ton of power was because she was married to both, not at the same time, but both the King of France (laughs) and the King of England. So she was the wife of Louis VII from 1137 to 1152. And then she was the wife of Henry II of England from 1154 to 1189. She was the mother of two kings, so Richard the Lionheart and John I. And then she was also the Duchess of Aquitaine in her own right, which is part of the reason why she ended up being married to these really important figures, because both of them wanted this area of Aquitaine. Yeah, she was important before she got married. Oh, yeah. She was very important before she got married. She also... So back at, back in the day, you know, we all kind of know this, you know, marriages were not about love. They were totally about politics. But she was sort of the first woman who said, 
and I actually would like to be courted, please. So she actually instigated this whole system of like courtly love and courtesans and troubadours and tell me a long epic poem about how beautiful I am. Good. Yeah. I want to be courted too. She was pretty awesome. So we have this area of Aquitaine that she was kind of in charge of. And so we have this historic link to it. And back in 2014, France redefined its political regions and created the area of Nouvelle Aquitaine, which united Aquitaine, the Limousin, and poitou charentes And it became sort of this, you know, major scare quotes here, indirect successor to medieval Aquitaine. These days, it is the biggest region in France. Its prefecture is in Bordeaux. So makes sense. Bordeaux is really important. And so within Nouvelle Aquitaine, we have this department. So France is divided into regions first and then departments second. There are like 95 departments in France. And one of the departments within Nouvelle Aquitaine is called Dordogne. And in the past, it was called Périgord. It's very confusing because in France, we love bureaucracy. But basically, we turned, we, we created departments during the French Revolution, which was ostensibly to make things simpler, which we often are ostensibly trying to make things simpler in France and only result in making them even more convoluted. So it kind of pre-jigged any like pre-existing territorial sort of ways that we would describe areas. And so when they created the departments, which are numbered and French people know them all in their order, they memorize them in school, which is one of the ways that I know I'm never, ever, ever going to be French. <laughs> and so they took names that weren't historical, like Périgord, and added instead geographical or hydrographic names to them. Well, so yeah, so it's named after the Dordogne River. Exactly. So the Périgord, which was this name that it had since Roman times, it disappeared. That said, it didn't really disappear because a, Périgord was slightly bigger than Dordogne, so there are places that would have been in this historic area that are not in Dordogne, but also because while the word could have disappeared, because it didn't really have a purpose anymore, it wasn't you know related to anything political or bureaucratic, it didn't because of this French obsession with terroir. So let's rehash terroir. Terroir is a concept that is very much intertwined with wine, but is also you know related to food. And it's an idea that the place is what gives a specific thing, a wine, its specialness. And so terroir is sort of the organizing principle behind French food. And here you find that the, the word Perigueur is used a lot to refer to the traditions, culture, the cuisine of the area. Dordogne is used when you're talking about sort of a place you're going to visit. Although I think there are parts of the Perigord, especially like around Sarlat and when you're in the forest there, that feel more Perigord than Dordogne. But it is, they're, they're interchangeable basically at this point. We're talking about the same place. Right. Yeah. And as you said, like Perigord is a little bit bigger. So there are going to be places that feel Perigord and don't feel Dordogne at all. But often we can kind of see a bit of overlap. So this area is, you know, as you said, very wooded, really beautiful. And it is also famous for one thing I know you love, Caroline, which is... Castles! There's so castles. many castles here. <laughs> there are castles everywhere. You cannot look over your shoulder without hitting a castle. I mean, it's the best. So yeah, there's tons and tons of castles left in this area from both the Renaissance and the Middle Ages. And the medieval castles are actually what are so cool, not just because they're older, but because this area was a major battleground during the Hundred Years' War. So the Hundred Years' War, it's a major conflict between France and England. It actually lasted 116 years, fun fact. And this sort of area of Dordogne, but also Gascony, which we'll get to in another area, and specifically Bordeaux, was kind of the the bone that these two dogs were fighting over, basically. Well, I know that you mentioned to me earlier about the Battle of Bergerac, and we're going to talk about Bergerac wine today, which uh, is where the English and Welsh archers were decisive because they attacked during dinner. Yeah, they attacked during dinner. And it's kind of, we're not entirely sure if this is true, but there are some legends associated with that battle, particularly about how, so the Brits, instead of giving each other the middle finger as an insult, they show two fingers, like kind of in a backwards peace sign. Like if you imagine you're showing the back of your hand in a peace sign, and that's an insult in the same way as the middle finger is. And they say that comes from this battle because when they captured archers during this battle, they would cut off those two fingers 
to make it so that they could never pull a, a bow again. And so if you still had your two fingers, it meant you'd never been captured. So you kind of show it to people like, eh, I've still got my ar- archer fingers. I have heard that story. Yeah. And that is a big way to say fuck you in England. So that's it great. Is. There you go. That's funny. <laughs> but why, I mean, Caroline, why is this area so essential to both the English and the French? Why do they want it so badly? Well, this area, you know, all of the sort of internal countryside is very rich in resources, food resources, particularly, but also Bordeaux is a natural port. So Bordeaux is a big estuary with, you know, the city on the estuary that leads into two huge rivers. So strategically, this is a place that that from a military standpoint, from any sort of trading access is a really important city. And that is something we're going to return to again and again, as we refer to Bordeaux the fact that it's a port city matters. It means everything. So in the 1300s, Bordeaux was actually controlled by the English crown and it was bigger. It had a bigger population than London. So this is something that people were fighting over. I mean, for both Bordeaux itself and for the Dauda and Perigord area, which is what we're going to chat about first. So within the Perigord, you can actually kind of divide it up into four major sections and you typically refer to them by color. So you have the Périgord Vert, which is uh, in the Northwest and is known for its greenery. It's home to the Parc Naturel Régional Périgord Limousin. So Limousin is the area that contains Limoges. We'll talk about that in another episode, but Limoges is a fun city. It's technically, uh, the keys to the city are technically owned by the city's butchers, which is kind of fun. (laughs) White Périgord gets its name because of the natural white limestone in the area. So it's home to the administrative center of Périgord, which is Périgueux, Périgueux, Périgueux. That's, oh, there's a lot of vowels in that word. Uh-huh. And the white limestone is used notably to build up the beautiful cathedral of that area. But for our interests, our podcast, we are mostly talking about food and wine and all that good stuff on this podcast. And so we're going to be focusing more on the other two Périgord. So Périgord Noir and Périgord Pourpre. So black and purple Périgord. So I'm going to start things off, get the ball rolling with Black Périgord, Périgord Noir. Is Sarla in Périgord Noir? It is. Uh, It is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the foodie town. That's the, I mean, I don't know about, I've never been to Dom, but Sarla is fucking huge. Yeah. Well, I love this region. The Périgord Noir is so beautiful. I have spent some time there. I've actually spent a lot of time in Daldon generally, but I was here last year And I love this part of the world because as you guys might not know, I actually studied archaeology in college. And so I'm a little bit of an archaeology nerd. And this is where all of these ancient Paleolithic cave dwellings are. So if you ever heard the phrase Cro-Magnon, which is what we used to call, nobody really calls that academically, but it's what you call basically cavemen. This is where the OG cavemen are from. And the Lascaux caves, those are the caves with the big animal murals and the handprints. And these were a big mystery for a while, how people made those handprints. And um, the theory is that people chewed on the pigment and then blew it onto their hands, which is kind of cool. And you can really see that. It's pretty obvious once you know that. But these were open to the public for a while, but they were actually closed. You cannot go visit them anymore because guess what? Tourism is not great for ancient caves and ancient archaeology and changing the humidity and everything. But the discovery of these caves is really cool. They were discovered in 1940 by a teenager after his dog, Robot, fell into a hole and he and his friends thought that it was probably a secret passageway into a nearby manor house. So they were like, dudes, let's go check it out. And then they discovered, you know, this ancient cave system. So there are a ton of really cool things to see around there in the village of Les Aisies de Tayac, which my ex-boyfriend is from and lives in. So I've been there a bunch. Hey, Caroline's ex-boyfriend. Hey, Guillaume. What's up? <laughs> so basically, the Magdalenian period is, that's an academic term that is named after this, this uh, you know, caveman moment, which is approximately 17,000 years ago during the Upper Paleolithic. So it's before the end of the last ice age. People are living in here in these caves and you can go to the La Madeleine, which is this, this site that, that, that is open. It was basically continuously occupied really until the castle burned down in the 1700s, but we call these troglodyte dwellings. And so that means that, and, and they still call it troglodyte and you can find, you know, homes today that people live in that are in these old caves that are in these sort of cliffs along the river. So it's really, really cool. And it's also a very delicious part of the world. It is indeed. Need to know what's going on in Paris this week? 
make sure to check out Don't Miss This on Paris Underground Radio. You'll learn about events, museums, restaurants, all the cool shit that's happening in Paris this week. Now it's time for a word from the sponsors of the podcast. And now back to the Terroir Podcast. I went to Lascaux, God, I don't know how many years ago. And what's cool is they have closed the caves to the public, but right next door, they did like a a 100% replica. They basically rebuilt the caves exactly the way they look in the real caves. So you can go walk through fake Lascaux caves to see (laughs) what it would have been like to be in the real Lascaux caves like 200 yards away. So um, it's cool. You should definitely do it. But afterwards, you should go eat something. Mm -hmm. So this area... Really, really well known for its cuisine. There was a famous culinary critic in France uh, in the 19th century called Kurnowski, and he wrote that Perigord is one of the regions of our country where we eat the best and for centuries. So it's got a long, rich history of fantastic food. Now, the Perigord Noir is known specifically for two key products that share its color. So black walnuts and black truffles. Mm. That said... It's people often will say, oh, yeah, that's how Black Perigord got its name. That's not true. That's retroactive etymology. The name comes from the fertile soil of the region, as well as the dark color of its beautiful evergreen forests. Yeah, it's it's a sort of like wild foresty place. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. So we are actually, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing. Uh, three different episodes on this region. And one of our episodes is going to be devoted entirely to the luxury products of this area. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about Perigord truffles today, just because they are pretty much the luxury product of this area. But I will just sort of say, you know, they have been growing wild in Southern Europe since ancient times. They used to be a working class food, which is true of a lot of foods that we perceive as luxury foods these days, like lobster, which they used to give to prisoners in Cape Cod. So uh, Perigot truffles used to be working class. They rose to fame later on, thanks to one of my favorite kings, but we'll chat about that later. But basically about four to nine tons a year of the 40 tons that are produced every year in France and the 700 tons of black truffles that are produced every year around the world come from Perigord. And people are super secretive about where they find them. So you uh, would have a hard time getting someone to tell you where they get their truffles. But uh, suffice it to say, they are linked to a very specific kind of oak tree called the truffle oak that come from this area. They're also not the only famous fungus of the Perigord. We also have a lot of sep mushrooms here, which is like a fresh porcini type mushroom. The most sought after is the tete noire or black head. So it's got a brown cap and white flesh. And those are in season in September. They also have like, they have tons of chanterelles. Yes. As well. And I have been mushroom hunting in the forest around Les Ezzy. And yeah, you go with someone who knows, you go early and and you pick your mushrooms and you have a really delicious lunch. Exactly. And then of course, we also have walnuts. So walnuts have long been synonymous with Perigord, dating back to the times that you were just talking about, the prehistoric times. So they were so coveted in this area that During the Middle Ages, they were actually used as currency. Walnut oil is really used here, not just in food, but also as lamp lighting liquid and to make ink and soap. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, Bordeaux being that major port city, these walnuts were exported to England and to Germany in the 17th century uh, by way of riverboats. So the Perigord walnut gets its AOC in 2002 and AOP in 2004. Can you give us a really quick rundown again of what those two things mean, Caroline? So we're talking about the appellation system again. Appellation d'origine contrôlée, appellation d'origine protégée. They are interchangeable. We're just moving towards the P more to be in line with EU regulations. And that means that they are protected. They have to come from a specific type of tree. They have to be a certain you know, farmed in a certain way and harvested in a certain way. And that is the way it is. I've actually done the walnut harvest in uh, the Daldone. I have some friends with a walnut farm. Oh my God. And it's, you know, it's, it's fun. Basically they like have a machine that shakes the tree. It like grabs it by the trunk, shakes it. And then they go, they have a machine. It's basically a giant vacuum and they suck them all up. And they have this thick, like almost succulent cactus like coating flesh around them so they go through a machine where they get kind of scrubbed and then i'm sitting on the the sorting table 
and you pull out the bad ones, keep the good ones. So it's pretty fun. And your hands go black because this green flesh is oxidizes really, really quickly. The like juice of it. And so by the end of the harvest, your hands are like black, like you're like reaching into the depths of hell. It's pretty funny. Yeah. And so that would be, I'm guessing then the sort of like the wet or fresh walnut, which you have, I think probably most people who've had walnuts, they're eating the dry ones. So the fresh ones are ones that are really sought after in the Perigot, right? They eat them fresh. We, I mean, they're amazing fresh, but these mostly on a, you know, production farm, they're going to be dried before they're sold. They're going to be dried. Yeah. Okay. So all along in Perigord, there's sort of this route de la noix where you can see farms. I'm sure like the one that you were doing the harvest at, as well as restaurants where they're going to feature a lot of walnut and we can see it in both sweet and savory applications in the Perigord. So you see it in salads and stuff, but you also have specific pastries. So that's one of the most popular ways to enjoy them. So you have a tarte au noix with kind of a short crust pastry, and then you have a gâteau au noix, so a, a walnut cake that's made with rum. And who doesn't love rum? And we are going to present you with my recipe for the tarte au noix. So I love walnuts. I think they're so delicious to cook with. And this is a really fun little recipe where you can bring a little bit of the Perigord into your own kitchen. Oh my God, I'm really excited to try that. Now, mm -hmm. one of my favorite ways to enjoy walnuts is, of course, paired with cheese. Let's talk about cheese. <laughs> of course. There are so many great cheeses in the Dordogne, and some of them have an AOP, some of them don't. There are some that are really, really specific to certain areas. There is a cheese called Schum, which is really popular in the UK. But I'm going to talk about a couple of my favorites, because if we talked about all of the cheeses that are in Dordogne... We would be here for, um, well, all day. So, uh, but one of my favorites from this area is Trappe des Chouignac. So one is cause, just because it's fun to say, a Chouignac. And you do find a lot of like ac endings in the Dordogne. So goes back to Roman times and this Latin ending acum, which is added to the ending of names of different sort of land areas. So it's one of the oldest cheeses in the Dordogne. And as so many cheeses are, it was invented by a monk. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Monks that are so busy, nothing to do except illuminate manuscripts and make cheese. So it's based on a recipe for a pre-existing cheese from the Loire Valley called Port Salut, which is uh, uh, really common in the US. You can find that in a lot of places. It's got like an orangey rind and kind of like a semi-soft texture. And the, these monks from the Abbey of Port Salut arrived at the Abbey of Notre Dame de Bonne Espérance, which are, is Our Lady of Good Hope in the Dordogne. And they started making cheese because uh, they had come to help the people of the area. And they were like, oh, what are we going to do while we're here? Well, we'll make the cheese that we made where we were from. But they end up, well, they, they create this cheese. But what ends up making it really special isn't the monks. It's when you get ladies coming. Woohoo! Nuns. So... I don't know. Are you allowed to call nuns ladies? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm a fan of nuns, personally. I, I love I, I went to Catholic school. Nuns are great. We had one nun left in a habit at my Catholic school, and everybody else was like in normal clothes. But they were cool. That's funny. Shout out to Sister Hosa. So anyway, the nuns arrived in 1923, and they took over the abbey. Now, they didn't kick out the monks, which would have been awesome, but the monks had already left. And the nuns realized that if they took the local liqueur made from walnuts... And they washed the already washed rind cheese with this walnut liqueur. They gave it this really specific, awesome, heady kind of nutty aroma. And that's still how they make it today. So these nuns, the order of Espera de Lally, are still there. And they are still washing this cheese and making it with, according to a secret recipe. And it has this really awesome kind of squidgy texture, kind of semi-soft, bounces back if you squeeze it. It's more compact than a lot of other cheeses because they press it. It has kind of a smokiness, a nuttiness, and it is super delicious. And particularly when paired with a specific local wine. Ooh, I mean, I would drink this with something a little sweet that we're going to talk about in a minute, maybe Montbeziac, but we'll come to that. So we do also have um, another kind of category of cheeses in this area, which is the cabecou. So C-A-B-E-C-O-U. Cabecou is Occitan, so the, the, the local dialect, Occitan, for little goat. So you have a lot of cheeses that are called cabecou. One of the most famous in the area is the cabecou du Périgord. It's a little round disc of goat cheese, usually eaten quite none, quite not none. I got, I got nuns on the brain. <laughs> 
So it's usually eaten quite young. It has a really nutty flavor. It's kind of a fresh little goat cheese. And you have a similar goat cheese in Kersi, so that sort of adjacent area. And in Kersi, you have this beautiful cliffside town called Rocamadour. And it's insane. Rocamadour is so beautiful. It's it's this crazy little business perched on the edge of a cliff, like going up the whole thing. It's so cool. It is the stuff of dreams. And and they also make a cheese that is the stuff of dreams. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's pretty, the Rocamador cheese is pretty widely available. Yeah, it's very widely available. And so it used to be called the Cabecou de Rocamador. So this idea of having like a little tiny goat cheese in every little town. But the Rocamador people wanted to be cooler than all the other Quebecus. So in 1996, six, they stopped calling it a Quebecou. They wanted to stand out. They wanted to be like Madonna, just one name. So Rocamadour. And they got their own AOC as a result. So that means that we ended up imposing specific breeds of goat on this cheese. So specific local breeds. They put it in its own little wooden box. And because it is so tiny, just over an ounce per piece, it is one of the smallest goat cheeses in France, and they actually only age it for up to a week, but sometimes not even a week. So you have this little Quebecou from Quercy that is absolutely gorgeous. It's the perfect pocket cheese. It really, this is like small pocket. This is like a child's pocket cheese. This is like, you might need more than one pocket cheese in your pocket. Yeah, you need like four. Yeah. These are teeny, this is like two bites. Yeah. Yeah. One bite if you're really, really hungry or you have a big mouth. hmm a big mouth like me. <laughs> and then I think one of my favorite cheeses from this area, because I am a big blue cheese fan. Oof, me too. Yeah. Is the Bleu des Causses. So the Bleu des Causses is, it gets its name from the Causses, which is the limestone plateaus of the Quercy, which have been sculpted over time by the river. And so because of the Causses, you have these natural limestone caves that you use to age the cheese and it lends this special aroma to the cheese. and People from from Quercy and people from Roquefort are both going to want to fight me on this, but it's basically, if you had to sort of imagine this cheese, it's like a Roquefort, but it's a little less funky because Roquefort is made with sheep's milk and Bleu de Cos is made with cow's milk. So it's got like a nuttier, kind of sweeter flavor to it. It sounds amazing. It's, it's honestly really beautiful. Roquefort is like my kind of go-to blue cheese in general. I just think it's like... Mm-hmm. There's it's, there's nothing bad you can say about it, but Bleu de Cos, if you find Roquefort to be a little too much, because it's it's funky because of the blue, it's funky because it's very salty, and it's funky because of sheep's milk. If you go for a Bleu de Cos, you at least lose one of the three funks. <laughs> I mean, I think that blue cheese should be funky, but it sounds amazing. I love Roquefort, though. Yeah. I love Roquefort too, but yeah, it's it's a little it's a little like Roquefort Roquefort Junior. That's really mean, actually. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Blue Day Coast. I love you. You're not Rook Ford Jr. You're your own thing. You're, do you do you, boo? You do you. Do you love French lingerie as much as I do? Because if so, you better head over to Paris Undressed with Kate. She will teach you all you need to know about the sexy world of French lingerie. And that is on Paris Underground Radio. Now it's time for a word from the sponsors of the podcast. And now back to the Terroir Podcast. So other awesome things hailing from Perigord Noir, we've got the local strawberries are amazing, protected by IGP. So that is a little bit like AOC Jr. So it's a protected label, but it does sort of tell you what you can and can't do. You have over 200 producers who are part of the IGP making seven different varieties of strawberries which makes it super fun to go buy strawberries in strawberry season in France. They're so different. Like in America, you don't, you don't know. You just have strawberries here. They taste completely different. So I know in Perigord, we have the Gariguette, we have the the Marais des Bois. Those are the little ones, right? The teeny tiny ones. Yeah. So the Gariguette are the teeny tiny long ones and the Marais des Bois Mm -hmm. are the teeny tiny, like almost spherical ones. And they have a like perfume like thing going on. They're very... They, they have a wildness to them that is incredible. Totally. And one of my favorite things to do in strawberry season, which kind of extends from April to October, is you go to your local vendor. I actually went, I went to Caroline's local market and talked to <laughs> Caroline's local strawberry vendor. And they'll, you'll go on like 
Wednesday and be like, ooh, those strawberries. Yes, delicious. And then you go on Saturday, you're like, give me the same ones. They're like, oh no, those ones are done. We've moved into the next variety. So they kind of follow each other. Yeah. And so you have to get your fill of each variety before it goes out of season. It really is one of the things about living here that that makes me so happy. So I'm recording this right now. We're recording on March 8th. And last night I had French asparagus for the first time this season at a restaurant. And I was so shocked to have it put down in front of me because it feels like it's still winter because it's cold right now. But my first asparagus is actually always a really defining moment for me. Like first asparagus means winter is over and it's spring. And it made me like legitimately tear up. I was like, it's asparagus season now. (laughs) First asparagus is the groundhog day of France. Yum. And it is funny because I think when you come from the States and you come from a place where we're forcing growth of a lot of things and we, we have California and we have, you know, we're importing stuff from, from Mexico, you aren't necessarily as aware of the seasons. Like I remember a friend of mine that I'd met in January and we were sitting around talking about all of the things that we miss from America. And it's like, oh, you know, I miss Jolly Ranchers and I miss marshmallow fluff. And she was like, and I miss asparagus. And I'm like, we have asparagus Ugh. here. It's just not time for it yet. Yeah. And no, you can get asparagus in December in France, but it comes from Peru and it tastes like shit. Right. And even, and it's, and it's harder to find. It's not like it's everywhere. Like you Mm -hmm. have to go looking for it. It doesn't look good. It looks like it's been through the wars. Because it has. Because it has. And so when you wait for the strawberries or you wait for the asparagus and you get your fill when it's the height of the season, by the time the season's ending, you're kind of like, oh, I don't know if I can eat any more asparagus. And then you're missing it in February. And then, and then you get a teary eyed, beautiful asparagus moment like you had last night. It really is. It it has made my life better. Honestly, eating the seasons has really made because the food it tastes better. Everything tastes better, and it's not like we don't have anything in winter. We do. We have great, you know, lots of good stuff in winter. But yeah, I know. Sorry, totally asparagus segue sidebar. Let's talk about. Will you please tell me about ducks? I will tell you about ducks. So again, we are going to have a luxury episode. So we're going to talk a little bit more about duck and goose during our luxury episode because this is a fairly luxurious product, mostly because Mm -hmm. part of the main reason we eat so much duck and goose in this region is because of the foie gras industry. So foie gras is a fatted liver of a palmiped, which is one of my favorite words. It is palmiped? Palmiped. It's the word for a webbed foot animal. So sounds like a band. I know. Sounds like a, like a, like an emo, like an indie band. Emily and the Palmipeds. Yeah. Oh, that's like a girl, a girl rock band. Yeah, I'll, I'll take uh-huh. it. Yes, please. So obviously we're raising these ducks and geese to harvest this fatty liver, which is delicious. And we're going to talk more about it. But we don't just eat the liver and throw the rest away. That would be ludicrous. So what are we going to do with the rest of the meat? Well, we're going to eat it. And we're going to eat it in a number of different ways. So the magret, which is the breast of the, mostly the duck in this case, we're going to cook it like a steak. The legs, mm. we're going to cook en confit, which is slow cooked in its own fat. Delicious. Mm. We use the confit either on its own. You can get it pan cooked and served with potatoes, usually pomme salardes, so named after the city of Sala, um, which is cooked in more duck fat. Or we can <sighs> make a charcuterie, a spread known as riette. So riette looks a lot like pâté, but it's not pâté. So pâté, the major difference is that pâté is made with meat and fat that are combined when raw and then cooked together, either baked in a tureen or preserved in like a jar. Whereas riette is made by cooking meat and fat separately and then shredding the meat. So it's basically like a finer than pulled pork texture, but like still has that natural grain of the meat in it. And then you mix it with the fat. So you have this spread that's made with the meat and fat of the same animal. I did not know that, but I didn't know that about the production. I love Riette. I could eat Riette all day, every day, and I could eat it with a glass of wine. Oh, but what kind of wine? Well, let's go to the purple Perigord. Perigord pourpre. Is pourpre a word that we would actually use to describe the word purple? No. No, it's like the it's okay. like the word for like the um the purple of the kings. But you say you okay, say okay. violet. You say violet. Yeah, violet. Like, yeah. I've never no. heard the word pourpre. pourpre. It's fun to say. <laughs> so this is a region that has a complicated wine history. And these days, the problem with the wines from the Daldun is that they don't really stand out. There is really good value here. Basically, you know, we're going to see this again and again. When there is a really powerful player in the wine trade, 
they kind of screw everyone else. So Daldone, the wines from Daldone have always kind of been at war with Bordeaux. At the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, the wines from the Dordogne were, the, were considered the high country, and they were actually thought to be finer than Bordeaux. But as they remained under French control, and the English basically controlled the actual city of Bordeaux, they relied less on the wines from the, the high country, and they encouraged Bordeaux to expand and make more wine. You know, a big reason that the English wanted Bordeaux was because they didn't make wine. They, it was too cold there, and they needed their booze, right? And they've always been huge consumers of Bordeaux, which we will talk about in our next episode. So the wines from the Daldon were more expensive because they were actually taxed in Bordeaux. And any wines that came from French territories weren't even allowed into the city until after the trading fleets had arrived in the autumn to pick up the wines for export. So they were filling up with Bordeaux and the other wines didn't have a chance to actually get exported. So there's a lot of that kind of bitchy politics in uh, wine history, which is always fun. After the Hundred Years' War, the Dutch basically took over the wine market and they were encouraging the production of sweet whites. So that's pretty interesting. The region was pretty slow to recover from phylloxera. Honestly, the town of Bergerac is kind of depressing. Like, it's really sad. You know, we have saint emilion which is Bordeaux proper, and we'll talk about next week. And then we have the town of Sarla, which we just talked about, Les Aises de Tayac, these beautiful medieval towns that are really awesome for tourism. But Bergerac itself is this another beautiful medieval town. It's just like, I don't know, Emily, if you've seen this in France, where a like mall opens up, you know, three roundabouts away from a medieval village and just like destroys the town. Oh, yeah, it's awful. The city of Meaux, like where the major brie market used to be near Paris, it's very similar. Like it's this beautiful old medieval town and they're starting to like inject it with tourism, which is great. And there are a lot of great initiatives in France to like rebuild the city centers. But often like, yeah, the little guys can't afford to open your butcher shop in the medieval town. So you've got like three Zaras and then outside, mm-hmm. because outside the city center, you've got some massive hypermarket. It's, it, it is sad. It's like, yeah, Bergerac, basically, you go through like eight roundabouts past like the world's most disgusting strip mall. Mm-hmm. And then you go into this, you know, beautiful medieval town that's just like boarded up windows. So it's kind of sad. And I really hope that they figure out how to how to make it better because it could be really beautiful. But Bergerac is our biggest player here. This is the wines you're going to find. They make a lot of different styles too, which is also problematic from a marketing perspective. They make sweet whites, off dry whites, dry whites, rosé, and red. The reds are the majority. They're going to do Bordeaux blends. That means Merlot and Cab and and some other grapes, but mostly Merlot here. Still, again, always in the shadow of Bordeaux. They tend to be really cheap and most of it is pretty industrial, um, pretty large production, not particularly interesting, but there are some really good ones and they're really good value. So the best are going to come from the AOC Pecharmont, which is again, an AOC within an AOC, an AOC within Bergerac or from the Côte de Bergerac. Those are more likely to be oaked. And there are some top producers here. If you do a little bit of research, you know, you can look it up on something like Decanter, Wine Enthusiast, to find some producers that are are worth uh, sourcing. But most of it is pretty inconsistent. And they definitely have not nailed um, marketing or, yeah, consistency. Yeah, because what seems to be problematic to me from, like, from just from a buyer's perspective in that is, like, if you walk into a shop and you're like, I like Bordeaux it has a certain style to it. Whereas if you walk into a shop and you're like, I like Bergerac, there's nothing to, there's no one cohesive thing to like, right? Well, I think, I think if you like Bergerac, you're probably drinking good reds that are very much similar to Bordeaux, but without the price tag. But if you, you know, if you have a good local wine merchant and they have a Bergerac, it should be good because your merchant is good. I think if you are in America or in England and you're listening right now and you get a pick up a Bergerac, it should be good if it's being exported. But most of it, here and certainly in the region is not that good. So it's it's unfortunate, but, but then some of it is, you know, so it's not like, I'm not like shitting on Bergerac, like there's some super good value here, but they haven't quite figured out how to exist in the shadow of Bordeaux in the 21st century. So, you know, they, they will hopefully. <laughs> I mean, hopefully. And that is a cool tip, like that if you're liking Bordeaux style wines and you want something a little bit cheaper, that's still really delicious, that a Bergerac might be a good option. Absolutely. And if it is a more premium price point, it should be really good. Really good. Okay. You know, like if it's really, really cheap, it might not be. But if you're spending, you know, 30, 30 bucks on a bottle of Bergerac, it should be awesome. And it's probably going to be a lot more awesome than 30 bucks for a Bordeaux. Right. Okay. Cool. You know, we we, we see that again and again, the sort of shadow f- effect. 
So Montbeziac is our other big wine around here. And this is a really cool wine. We're going to talk more about the production of this when we go to our luxury episode and I talk about Sauternes. But this is a sweet dessert white wine. It's botrytized, which means it comes from moldy grapes from Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc, and uh, Muscadel, which is a grape that pretty much only really does well here in Sauternes. There's very little of it. It is part of the Sauternes blend. And we'll talk about how these wines are made in the luxury episode. Uh, most of the Montbeziac is really large scale and done at the co-op, but there is one very good producer who I actually have been to visit and who really makes incredible wines. And that is Chateau de Tircule la Gravière. And the name is really funny because it literally means like pull ass. <laughs> Tircule. And um, there is a story behind it. I forget all of the details, but it was someone who needed to get like pulled up the hill with their, with their wine. And so they're really nice people and they make really good wine. So if you see a Chateau de Tircule, La Graviere, ever at a restaurant or in a shop, that is a seriously fine wine. Yeah, that is, that is it for the wine. I mean, it is a really interesting, interesting area that has a lot of opportunity for development. So I wouldn't, you know, if you hear me say this and you go see a Bergerac, don't, you know, don't, don't be shady with it. It could be really good. It could be really good and it will be very good value. So I, I'm excited about these wines and I really hope that they can kind of get get their uh, act together and, and that takes time. So we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm really excited to hear even more about wine from you next week because we're going to be focusing on that caster of the shadow, Bordeaux. Whew, and it's a big one. It's a big one. So you definitely got to come back next week for our Bordeaux episode where I'm going to be trying to condense... 2,000 years of history into, what, 40 minutes? (laughs) Something like that. And I am going to be eating popcorn and watching you try to do that. (laughs) Beautiful. Beautiful. If you are going to make my tarte au noix périgordine, my walnut tart, the thing to drink with it would be a nice bottle of Montbeziac. So try to go get yourself a bottle of the Chateau de Tircule. And, you know, it's going to be the most delicious little little dessert you could ever do. Mm. And if you can find yourself a trap de chouignac, you could start with your trap and finish with your tart and drink the whole, the same bottle all the way through. That sounds insane. I'm doing it. Me too. If you like this podcast, make sure to follow me. I'm at Wine Dine Caroline on Instagram. Follow Emily at Emily underscore in underscore France. And make sure to please rate, review, subscribe. It helps us so much, especially on Apple Podcasts. And tell your friends about the Terroir Podcast. And we will see you next week where Caroline takes us on a deep dive through uh, the history of Bordeaux, Bordeaux blends, and more. And I might talk to you about cake. This episode of the Terroir Podcast was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.